Hello chess fans, this is Rick from chess to impress Only 38 days till the World Championship match between Carlsen and Kairana. A month and a week, that's all we have to wait. It's going to start on November 9th in London. And on chess to impress we continue the countdown, the build up to the great match. By looking at the 46 previous events in the history of the undisputed and official World Championship. We have arrived in 1969. World Champion Petrojan had beaten Boris Spassky three years earlier, and Spassky qualified for the match again. The 1967 Interzonal Tournament was played in Susa in Tunisia in Africa in October and November of that year. The top six qualified for the candidates along with Spassky and Tal, who were seeded into the candidates as finalists of the previous tournament. A major controversy occurred when Bobby Fischer, who was leading the tournament with seven wins and three draws in ten rounds, abandoned the event over a dispute with the organizers. Fischer walked away, he was almost sure to qualify for the candidates, but his principles stood in the way. Ben Larsen went on to win the interzonal event with Korchnoi, Geller, Gligorich and Portis taking the next four places. That was a three-way tie for sixth place with Ryshevsky, Hort and Stein, who played a playoff to determine the final place in the candidates matches. Ryshevsky qualified. These were the candidates' matches. Spassky beat Geller in the first round, and Larsen beat Portis, Tal beat Gligorich, and Korchnoi beat Ryshevsky. In the semi finals, Spassky beat Larsen, and Korchnoi beat Misha Tal. In the final, Spassky beat Korchnoi and qualified again for the World Championship match against world champion Tigran Petrojan. What did the seventh world champion Vasily Smyslov say about the match before the match? The world champion has penetrated deeper perhaps than anyone into the secrets of positional maneuvering. He's finely sensitive to all the nuances of the struggle on the chessboard. Who will win? Petrosian or Spassky? It's hard to say. I wish to make just one remark. There is a Russian saying, repetition is the mother of understanding. In 1954 I could not win the crown from Botvinnik, but three years later I succeeded in doing so. Why should not Spassky also do the same? He has every ground for achieving it. That's what Smyslov thought of it. A picture from the match. World champion Petrojan on the right and his challenger Spassky on the left. And in this video we're going to look at game 19 of this match. Let's get into it. The score before game 19 was 9.5 points to Spassky and 8.5 to Petrojan. Spassky was one point ahead. It was played on the 4th of June 1969. White is Spassky and black is Petrojan. I'm using the comments from Salo Flor, who was a leading chess grandmaster from Czechoslovakia, from the era that this match was played in. e4 from Spassky, c5 from Petrojan, the Sicilian defense, knight f3 and d6. Petrojan had played e6 in earlier games in this match. He did not get the positions he wanted from that Paulson variation which came onto the board. So he switched to d6 on the second move. d4 takes, takes, knight f6, knight c3, a6, and bishop g5. Knight bd7, bishop c4, queen a5, attacking the bishop, queen d2, protecting the bishop, and a6, which was a popular move in those days. Both Spassky and Petrojan had experience with this variation. But now Spassky took on f6 and Salo Flor writes a new move and quite incredible that nobody looked at this move before. There was such a high regard for the bishop pair and are still now in 2018 still a very high regard for the bishop pair. But this was already a new move in 1969 according to Salo Flor. Petrosian took with the knight and Spassky castled queenside. Here e5 was suggested by Grandmaster Geller to try and contain White's attack, but in the game Petrojan chose e6. The rook went to the center, bishop e7 and f4. And now Petrojan castled kingside, bishop back to b3, rook e8, king b1, we very often see that move when Grandmasters castle queenside. They very often play the king to b1 at some stage. 
and bishop f8, taking white's ideas of knight d5 out of the position. Let's see what Salo Floor means by that comment. Let's make a different move for black, bishop d7 instead of bishop f8. Then white can play knight d5 if he wishes. And now the queen is attacked and is unprotected there on a5. Queen takes d2 and then knight takes e7 check as an in-between move, taking away black's bishop pair. Rook takes, rook takes, and that is an option for white. With the bishop on f8, that option is no longer there. And now let's look what Spassky plays here. He has centralized his rooks. You would expect him to play in the center, but here he corks out the move g2, g4. What a move. White has just played his rook to the center, and now he follows up with g4. Incredible. If you and I play that move, it's a bad move. It doesn't make sense to centralize your rooks and then push a pawn on the king side. But when Spassky plays it, it is a brilliant move. Here, Petrojan thought for 18 minutes and then decided to take the pawn. Queen g2, hit in the knight, the knight went back and rook g1. Classical play, sacrificing a pawn to open a line and then put the heavy artillery on it. Bishop d7, black needs to finish his development and f5. Here e5 was suggested by Misha Tal, but for a positional player like Petrojan this is a difficult move to make, giving white the d5 square and also improving the bishop on b3, writes Salo Floor. After f5 Petrojan played king h8. Rook df1 and queen d8. The queen hurries back to help. Queen e5 is a better option according to the engine. After queen d8, Spassky took on e6, f takes, and another wonderful move, e5. A second pawn sacrifice to enable knight c3 to join the attack through e4. Classical way of playing, pushing e5 to free up the e4 square. We see that in other openings as well. d takes e5, knight e4, Spassky wants to have all pieces attacking. All pieces want to join the party. Well, what can we say about this position? Firstly, you cannot take that knight, because then it's mate in two. Rook takes f8 check. Rook takes and queen takes g7 is checkmate. That's how dangerous white's attack is already. You can also not take the other knight, because then knight takes f6. With a huge advantage for white, a winning attack. Again, you cannot take that knight because of checkmate. What else is there? White is threatening to take on f6, as we just saw, you cannot take that knight back. So Petrojan played knight h5, played the knight away from that f6 square. And now queen g6 from Spassky. And Flora writes, as always, Spassky finds the most energetic way to win. There are several ways to win here, but queen g6 is indeed the most energetic one, putting the queen very close to black's king. Petrojan now thought for a long time, but his position is already beyond repair. Flor gives the move knight f4 as an option, which was not played. And then white has a very nice exchange sacrifice. Rook takes f4, e takes f4, and knight f3 to jump to g5. Black has then queen b6. And you have to be careful. It's never too late to blunder away the game. If you now play knight to g5, then it's black who wins this game of chess. This is checkmate. Okay, so what if we play the other knight to g5? This knight is now protecting the rook. But then ace takes g5, and you have to take with the rook. And then queen f2, and believe it or not, black has enough counterplay here. Counterplay with just the queen, but it is enough for equality because of the checkmate threat and threatening the knight. Black is back in this game. And after queen b6 he cannot play rook g2 to prepare knight to g5 because then there is queen b5. Very nice move. Threatening again checkmate, this time on f1. And also threatening to come to f5, bringing the queen into the defense. And it is in fact black who is better here. So what to do after queen b6? Well white has another beautiful move. Rook g5. There is no queen g1 checkmate, there is no queen b5, 
if you take the rook, then knight e takes g5. That is the right knight. There's still no queen g1 because of the knight on f3. And there's a forced checkmate on h7. Queen h7 is checkmate. So what else is there after rook g5? Well, not much. Floor gives bishop c6 in his book. And then knight f6 with checkmate threats everywhere. The nicest one is bishop e4 to defend against queen h7 checkmate. But then there is a nice queen sacrifice. We all love a queen sacrifice. Queen takes h6 check. You have to take back. And this is a nice checkmate with rook and knight. After rook g5, the engine sees nothing better than giving away the queen with e5. Queen takes b6. If that is the best defense, then there is indeed something very wrong with black's position. It's totally lost. So all this after queen g6 and then knight f4. But in the game, Petrojan took on d4. And the last move of the game was knight g5 from Spassky. Winning in all variations. The threat is checkmate on h7. So h takes g5, then queen takes h5 check, king g8, queen f7 check, king h8, and rook f3, with the threat of rook h3 checkmate. If you play e5 to protect the h3 square, then there is a checkmate on h5 or on g8. After knight g5, Petrojan saw this variation and resigned. And Salaflor writes, wonderful, glittering, in real Aljochen style. One should give Spassky such praise after such a glowing game. And now Spassky was 10.5, 8.5 up. And needed only 2 points out of the remaining 5 games to become the 10th world champion. And Spassky succeeded. He got the 12.5 points after 23 games. So he only needed 4 more games after the one we saw to get to the required number. There was a very funny comment I saw on the internet when preparing for this video. Somebody said that after this crushing victory from Spassky that we just saw, that Petrosian must have been demoralized. And somebody else replied, yes, he was so demoralized that he won the next game. As you can see, Petrosian bounced back by winning game 20. But Spassky won game 21 and the last two games were drawn. Boris Spassky was the 10th official and undisputed world champion of chess. The last time that a non-Soviet Russian player was involved in a match for the World Championship was in 1948. 34 years later, it was an American, the great Bobby Fischer, who qualified for a match against Spassky in the middle of the Cold War. And I'll tell you about that match in the next video. Hope you like this video and that you keep counting down to Warsaw Carlson Karana match with me. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe to the Chess Swim Press channel and please leave a comment. I will read them all and I will reply. If you like the video and if you like the series, it would be great if you could share it on social media by clicking the share button on YouTube. The link to the series is here. And this is Rick for Chess Press. Thank you for watching.